This is a production of Cornell University. All right, so we've got this volume. We have a somewhat of an understanding of how this volume of material is modified and changed into soil. What the heck does it do? Okay, these are sort of the functions of that volume of material. And most of these functions you guys would pop off the top of your heads. Okay, obviously it's an engineering medium. We build things in it all the time. We build road beds, we build buildings, we put septic systems in there. We do all different kinds of stuff. Okay, but it's not just a building material for uh, this, us, human made materials. It's also a building material for plants. Plants actually need the soil for a lot of reasons, but plants actually need the soil for, from an engineering sense because it needs something to structurally anchor itself so that its biomass can grow above and below the ground. Okay? There are things in the world called air plants. They don't need the soil, but most plants need that material to grow in from an engineering sense. They also need that material to grow in from a growth media. The soil is the major supplier for most, if not with one exception, all of the nutrients. It is the way we get it. That we get it, the plants get it, which ultimately we get. Okay? So this media is the nutrient supplier and it's also the water supplier for plants and for us and ultimately the plants for us. Okay? It also so it's recycling this nutrients, putting it into here. It's getting the water, it's putting it into the plants. It's the engineering material for the plants and for everything else. But it's also a huge habitat for these organisms. Remember me saying, there's that teaspoon of soil, how many organisms are in it? Okay? These organisms are driving much of this in this, which then provides for this. Okay? They are doing the decomposition. That decomposition is putting organic matter into the soil, but it's also releasing the nutrients that are in that organic matter for the plants to take up. They're also degrading all different types of organic materials which purify the water supply. So that when the water comes out for the plants and for us, it's clean. Er. Cleaner. Make sense? Now I'm sure you guys can come up with lots of examples for these sort of five functions. Can you think of some of them? Don't, you don't have to yell it out at this point, but think about it. The reason I s ask you to do that is because this is how we figure out the interpretations. This is how we figure out the uses of these soils. Why do we want to know these properties? Because of these five very important functions. And if we can figure out the properties that drive these things, we can figure out different ways to make interpretations and manage the soils for whatever goal it might be. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of-ish. Cool. All right, back to what is a soil. It's a portion of the landscape, supports soils, and has properties that are due to alteration, but are integrated effects of the climate, of living material, acting upon some sort of parent material that's conditioned by relief over periods of time. Gobbledygook, right? This is basically the soil function equation. You guys ready for this? Soils are a function of five things. We call these functions factors. Soils equal a function of Parent material. What is parent material? Rocks and organic material. One of our definitions of what soil is, right? Rocks and organic material. Okay? This parent material is affected by climate. Okay, what's climate? Temperature and moisture. Temperature and moisture. We've talked about both of those. Okay? As the temperature rises, biological activity increases. We talked about the tundra. Okay? As moisture arises, potentially it increases organic activity until it gets to a point at which there's too much water and 
aerobic organisms basically cease operations. Now, that doesn't mean there's not anaerobic organisms, and it doesn't mean there's not organisms out there that have figured out how to function in water. But if there's no oxygen in the water, I'm not like fish can figure out how to swim in water, but if there's no oxygen in that water, the fish can't survive in the water. Does this sound familiar? Eutrophication and things like that. Okay. So climate drives a lot of the biota. And the next one is biota. The organisms. Okay. So one, two, three. Okay. The distribution of biota and climate and parent material is also affected by there we call it relief, but I'll call it topography. Okay? The shape of the land. Okay? If I have a flat surface versus a V surface, what's going to happen to the water? It rains, and I've got a nice flat landscape. Every drop of rain that hits here is basically going to go here. And every drop of rain that hits here is probably going to go over here. And everything that's over here is going to hit over here, it's going to go here. But what happens if I have a valley? It rains on the ridge. Where does the water go? It goes down into the valley. So relief is going to affect climate. Why? Well, climate's bringing the rainfall in, but relief is redirecting that rainfall to certain points of the landscape. And if I have some points of the landscape that are wetter than others, I'm going to have different functioning, different soils forming. Does that make sense? And then last is time. Why time? Around here we're basically looking at 10, 12,000 years of soil formation. Any idea why? Glaciers. Glaciers. That's actually what the story is going to be about this afternoon, or this, not this, later in this, later in this lecture, hopefully, if I don't run out of time. Okay? Glaciers. Not all the entire world had glaciers, though. I'm going to say this, and you're going to hear me say this a lot of time. A lot, a lot, a lot. Okay? If you give me a weak acid and give me a million years, I'll dissolve anything. Now, if you give me a weak acid in one day, not a lot is going to happen to that material. But if you give me a million years, I can basically dissolve anything. Does that make sense? So if we're talking about a material being altered to form something, Time has a huge impact. Small, cumulative, incremental steps over a million years is going to totally change a material. Small, incremental steps over a week isn't going to change a lot. Does that make sense? But that's also dependent upon the material that I'm acting on. If I'm acting on a really resistant material, it's going to take a million years. But on the other hand, if it's a material that I can basically break up in my hand, it may just take a week. Does that make sense? So that takes us all the way back to the nature of that parent material. So all of these are interacted or inter interrelated. Does that make sense, everybody? Which brings us back to this component. Does that make sense now? Big, long, gobbly gook. Now, next part of this, we've been talking about soils as if it's just like one spot, very discrete. Okay, it's right here. And then there's another one that's over here, because there was the ridge, and here's the valley bottom. Okay? But soils are also a very complicated landscape. They're, they are a portion of the landscape. They're very intimately related. Okay, here is me standing on top of a soil. This is what we call a polypedon or a pedon. This is the pedon. This is the, you know, the body that represents a soil. Okay? But you know, if I take a couple steps over here, the soil might actually be the same material that's right there. Okay? So I could actually put this soil, and the, or say this pedon, and this pedon over here, and say, well, it's the same soil. Okay? So I can take these pedons, these individual units that we measure, put them together, and I call it a polypedon. Okay? And that's my unit of soil. Okay? But if I kept walking over here, and I stood on this pedon over here, it actually could be different than that soil over there. Okay? So the question then is, okay, where in here am I seeing the break from this soil to that soil? 
And what, more importantly, what is it that's making that soil different than this soil? So these soils, I mean, here's the equation. Here's that equation. Any one of these things, or a multitude of them, could be the reason that this soil is different than this soil. And you will literally see, in some cases in this landscape, very discrete lines where I step from this spot and I go over here, I've got differently different soils. But you will also see a long, a very, dis, you know, an attenuated, dis, not discrete at all, an attenuated transect of characteristics where here, I step here, there's a slight difference, 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 until ultimately, okay, it's distinctly different than over there. But this was a gradual change. In some cases, it's very discrete. In some cases, it's very gradual. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? And that's what this landscape is. We have this, the pedon, which makes up this polypedon, which is basically all these little pedons are basically the same. And that's one type of soil. But this polypedon is one part of a larger landscape. And the discrete nature of the, these lines is not necessarily true to what we see in the world. Sometimes it is discrete. Sometimes it's a very abrupt change. But often it is an attenuated change of properties across a larger landscape. And that's one of the big things that we're going to be talking about and learning about this semester. If you're a farmer, it's all well and good. It'd be awesome if everything was very discrete. But if I'm growing corn on this side and corn on that side, and I have two different soils, but the attenuation between the soils is very gradual, it's going to make it a lot harder for me to manage the corn on this side than the corn on that side. Does that make sense? And it's not just the farmer. What happens if I'm a homeowner and my septic system runs right through both of these? These are some of the things that we, this is why we want to talk about this. OK? Questions so far? This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.